Ever since Richard Hatch washed up on the shores of Pulutiga in Survivor Borneo, not only the US was inspired, but also fans all around the world. G'day guys, welcome back to Snuffle, where we discuss everything about the greatest game on television, Survivor. Today, we venture over to Australian and South African Survivor as we take a look at some of the greatest characters to grace our screens in International Survivor. Which castaways could succeed in the US Survivor and challenge the likes of Tony Vlachos and Saree Fields for the million dollar prize? We're going to be discussing exactly that as we determine which international survivors would excel in a hypothetical US vs the world season. There have been so many great castaways in international survivor who don't get the recognition they rightfully deserve. Joining me today to discuss these castaways is Analytical Strategy, a fellow survivor content creator right here on YouTube. G'day everyone, Analytical Strategy here, a fellow Survivor content creator that is addicted to this crazy game. I really enjoy delving into a lot of components of Survivor, but in particular designing new strategies that could be implemented in future seasons, or breaking down aspects of the production side of the show, inclusive of rewards or advantage ideas. But in all honesty, all of it combined really adds to why this is the greatest game this world has ever seen. Thanks very much to Snuffed for having me on his channel, and I look forward to delving into some of the international Survivor players, which often get unnoticed on this platform. Also joining me will be Chris from Reality Pop, my co-host on the Survivor Worldwide podcast. Thank you for having me on this video to talk about the greatest show on earth, and more specifically, International Survivor. Reality Pop is your hub for all things reality. We have a great team who are passionate about various reality TV shows, and we podcast about it. We also have a talented team that do top 10s and various best of videos for these shows. Since we are the new kids on the block, this is your time to get involved and help us shape the evolution of our channel. Head over to Reality Pop on YouTube and subscribe and let us know what you think of our content so far. So for this video, myself, Chris, and Analytical Strategy will each pick one castaway from Survivor South Africa and one from Australian Survivor, and we'll kick it off with Analytical Strategy. The South African Survivor player I will be discussing is Rob Bentele, the winner of the Island of Secrets. Rob to me played one of the most dominant games in any version of the show, which would result in him being a huge target if he were to play in US Survivor. However, I feel like he has a lot of characteristics to do well in a lot of variations of the show. Rob firstly is built like a truck, so his appearance actually seems like the type of player that would be an early merge boot, due to this physical prowess. So for him to have this appearance and still be a social powerhouse is a real credit to his game. I feel like Rob would cruise to merge in most seasons he would play, and due to his social charm and charisma, along with his strength in individual immunity challenges, winning 5 total, tying the record in both Survivor South Africa and US Survivor, it makes him a very dangerous player long term. Rob is also able to use the twists of the game to his advantage, and with US Survivor trending in a very advantage heavy direction, Rob is able to think of ways the game is designed to ensure this benefits his personal game. His manipulation of the Islands of Secrets twist was extremely clever. Coming up with the concept that he could view votes to protect himself from being blindsided, it was pure gold. He was also able to get an idol of someone in the early stages of the game. He constantly was able to make people think that he had their best interests in mind, being the centerpiece of this game, and the person that everyone wanted to feed information to, which really enabled him to know everything that was going on on the island, which is really strong social characteristics to have in alternate versions of Survivor as well. Most importantly, he was on the right side of every single vote that happened, putting him really as one of the most elite players of all time. Rob is also extraordinarily loyal, bringing the Amigos Alliance all the way to the end, which did work out for the cast he played with, but I feel like he would have to adapt with alternate variations of players, and it would be really interesting to see if he had the ability to do so. I do see this as similar to Kim in One World though, making the cast he played with actually appear to be worse than they were, because Kim and Rob were just that good and dominant within their seasons, so I do feel like he could adapt and excel with a variation of players. I just really see him as a powerhouse of a player, someone I would love to see play again, and someone I think could do a really good job in US Survivor. This is the island of secrets, and secrets have a tendency to come out. Rob Bentele is definitely someone I could see doing well in US Survival with his great social game and ability to manipulate others, very similar to someone like Boston Rob. Now it's over to Chris with his pick. For my first pick, I had to go with the king of the jungle, the people's champ Luke Toki. 
Luke played in two seasons of Australian Survivor, and he is arguably the biggest character from this franchise. In his first season, he aligned early on with his right-hand man Jericho, and was shown to be someone who wasn't afraid to go against the power structures within his tribe. He flipped on early alliances to gain control, and ultimately became too big of a target at the merge, placing 7th in his first season. Luke was loved in his first season by the Australian public since he had a really compelling story playing the game for his wife and kids, a real family man. He showed a willingness to work hard within camp as someone who came from a blue collar mining background, however his real talent, we would find out quickly, was scheming and plotting while playing a killer social game. Everybody wanted to be Luke's friend since he had such great energy. All of this made Luke a lock to come back and play the game for a second time. When Luke returned for his second go round, he was placed in a season with 23 new players of the game. Being the only returning player within the season, he had a massive target on his back. He formed part of the Champions Tribe in a season themed Champions vs Contenders 2. Luke found himself outside of the early alliances, similar to his first season, but quickly worked on his social bonds within those power structures. Luke worked on getting Ross to flip on the majority's sporty alliance by having fun with him and stealing bananas at night. He aligned with David Gannat who helped him bring over Abby to his minority alliance. Luke had learned something from his first season. He needed a bigger meat shield in front of him to avoid being voted out early at the merge. Luke survived a tribe swap, being outnumbered 2-7 to seven thanks to his great social game. Once again getting the majority alliance to turn on each other, sending contender after contender home. It was really like watching great poetry in motion. He's a player that found himself at the bottom at various times within his two seasons, but he always found a way to work his way out of it through great social play, key immunity wins, and playing advantages in a very innovative way. And did I mention he also found idols? Luke ultimately went on to place fourth in his season after setting a record for the most individual immunity wins with an Australian survivor at that time. I believe that Americans would fall in love with Luke Toki, like Australians did. He very much reminds me of Tony Vlachos. He even built his own spy shack on Australian Survivor. <laughs> you shall not blindside me! <laughs> Luke Toki is one of the most beloved contestants of Australian Survivor and I'm sure he would receive similar praise from US audiences. From Survivor South Africa, I've selected Vanna Joubert, who entered Season 6 Philippines as a pastor and Survivor superfan, willing to lie, cheat and steal, pressing pause on his real-life ethics. He enjoyed a successful tribal immunity run early on, only attending three tribal councils before the merge, and found himself on the right side of the vote each time. Vanna was always on the lookout for advantages and played his idol at the final nine after PK negated five votes, prompting Vanna to recognise that he may also have votes against him, negating two votes to force a tie and send Shane home. After Vanna masterminded Tony's elimination together with Jean, the tiger was firmly placed on Vanna who was perceived as running the show, and while he was in the firing line he managed to keep himself safe by winning individual immunity and sending PK home. After his immunity win, Vanna was firmly on the chopping block but through Katinka's social faux pas, Vanna recognised that his votes were instead going to be cast toward his former Mindanao tribe mate John, so at the final five, he recognised this and selflessly played his idol to save her, negating three votes and sinking Katinka, sending her straight to the jury. Vanna would be voted out on day 37 at the final four as the last remaining male Mindanao member, and after Jean won an advantage, he was selected to be removed from the jury. There's no doubt that after his last time out was cut short and he was unable to complete his goal of winning the title Soul Survivor, he would be willing to play a ruthless game yet again and pose a massive strategic threat using advantages in his favour if he was to play in a modern US season. Vander is someone who can truly be considered a game changer within Survivor South Africa, introducing a whole new era of strategic gameplay that has launched the show into an exciting modern game. Going out two days before the end is brutal and it's heartbreaking. I was in control of his game for a long time. I voted many people out and tonight they voted me out. I am heartbroken, but I'm so glad I got to play this game I love. Now the Australian Survivor member I will be discussing today is the golden god himself, David Gennett. 
Similar to Rob from Survivor South Africa, I think David would have the biggest target on his back out of anyone who has ever previously played an Australian Survivor, like Rob would in South Africa, due to winning the All-Stars season in an extremely dominant fashion. In Australian Survivor there are 50 days instead of 39, so the pace of play is a little bit slower in comparison to US Survivor. But David still found ways to play hard in the early stages of the game, but still avoid being the target, which in Australian Survivor is an extremely difficult thing to do. I think his style of play would transition extremely well to US Survivor, being one of the most adaptable people that I've ever seen play the game. And adaptability to me is one of the most important traits a really good Survivor player can have. Given he was around 40 years old when he played in Survivor All-Stars, David was able to easily put on a younger persona to align with the Varkama tribe and slide right into a subtly dominant role from the get-go. He allowed the likes of AK and Lockie to appear like they were the kingpins of the game, whilst he was really the one subtly putting names out there and making convincing arguments of who should be the ones to go home. Another major attribute David possesses which adds to how dominant he is, is being able to convince other people to be involved in his ideas, which on the surface seem mutually beneficial. The power play with Matt in Survivor All-Stars was genuinely one of the most thought out and best moves I have ever seen in any version of the show. Being able to align with the leader of the opposing alliance, to get fed intel no matter where it was coming from makes sense from both of their perspectives, but more importantly to David's game. Knowing he was in the majority, and therefore wouldn't be able to get idled out if he knew where the votes were going, and also preparing to have that shield later in the game if Matt was able to stay for a longer period of time. Another example of this is being able to convince Phoebe to give him the idol clue as she was unable to find it herself, but the way he did this was extremely important, as he didn't ask for it straight away. He waited until she really needed the help before she gave up that information. So this adds to why I think he could excel in a US variant of this show. As even if he was this massive target, no matter where he lies in the game, he's able to come up with a concept which is mutually beneficial to an alternate member, which could enable him to stick around longer than anticipated. I really could talk about him for so much longer, but in closing, his traits of adaptability and having such a highly strategic mind would translate not only to Australian Survivor, not just US Survivor, but any variation of Survivor I have ever seen. The Golden God has risen again! How's <sighs> already uh, getting uh, going to my head? Uh. I love David. The Golden God is not only one of the all time great Australian Survivor players, but also one of the most entertaining characters. Now, back to Chris for his pick from Survivor South Africa. Okay, so for my second pick, I would have to go with a player that reminds me of Adam Klein, Jack Berger. Jack played in Survivor South Africa Island of Secrets. He proved to be someone who was ahead of his castmates in that season by finding the very first advantage, the plus one vote. This allowed him to have an additional vote at the merge. Jack also found two hidden immunity idols in his season after gaining information from his tribe mate Quibbers on where it may be hidden. He butchered his first idol play of the season after a day of planning with Ting Ting, his right hand girl, on how to play it. They were convinced that Ting Ting would go home at Tribal Council. The saving Grace Haver would have been Jark playing the idol for Ting Ting at the Tribal Council. Jark Haver got nervous at the last minute. The fan in him didn't want to play the idol on her in case he ended up going home instead. This move put Jark at a big disadvantage since the rest of his tribe didn't trust him any longer. In comes the first tribe swap of the season and Jark finding that second immunity idol on his second tribe. Jack rebuilt his social connections and found a way to be one of only three survivors of his new tribe after losing tribal immunity after tribal immunity. Jack very smartly leveraged this idol and plus one vote advantage to make himself a useful member in his new alliance to go into the merge with some ammunition. Ultimately, Jack would go on to join the Spitshaker 7 alliance who would dominate most of the votes after the merge. He ran out of runway when his main alliance members and Quibbus and Sipe was voted out of the game. This didn't stop Jack from putting on a great show haver by faking his tribe out on when he would play the Hidden Immunity Idol, which won him an extra three days in the game. This was impressive since it showed that Jack had learned something from playing his first idol incorrectly. Jack finished in seventh place in his season of Survivor. Overall, Jack is a scrappy player. He is someone who has a keen eye for idols and advantages in the game. He instinctively knows when to shift gears and to adapt to different scenarios, and he is a proven, experienced player who knows how to play from the bottom. He also has a great mind for the game, and is good at confessionals and at tribal council. 
I believe that he is the best suited player from South Africa to adapt to the fast playing style of current US Survivor. I would rather be remembered as a player who played an active game and who made moves and who stood out the most memorable than be reflecting back afterwards and say, oh, I wish I had done something else. Jacques was such a scrappy player that always fought from the bottom and would be well suited to a modern US season, so it's nice to see him in this company. From Australian Survivor, I've selected one of the greatest female challenge beasts in any version of Survivor, Brooke Jowett, first appearing in 2016 and later returning for All Stars. She draws comparison to Natalie Anderson, the winner of San Juan del Sur, for her dominant individual immunity performance and her great social game. On her first season, Brooke formed a strong alliance with her fellow Sanapu members, Flick, Matt and Sam, later adding Elle and Lee and riding all the way to the final seven. She was seen as a threat due to her strong strategic game and two individual immunity wins. And at the final seven, she was ultimately betrayed by her closest ally and best friend in the game, Flick, who blindsided her in a 4-3 vote. Brooke would later return in All-Stars, finding herself in a majority alliance on the Vakama tribe with Lockie and AK, but fell into the minority. However, she kept her hopes alive, winning five individual immunity challenges until her luck ran out at the final four when she was taken out in a unanimous 3-1 vote. Brooke would be right at home in a US Survivor season, with her ability to form strong social bonds comparable to someone like Parvati Shallow, and her dominant individual immunity run, giving her strong hopes of progressing deep in the game. She's not afraid to cut her allies after learning from her mistakes in her first appearance, and will no doubt prove to be a beast to reckon with in challenges. Brooke is someone that does not get nearly enough praise. I truly believe that she is one of not only the strongest Australian Survivor female castaways, but one of the strongest across all versions of the show. So, which international Survivor castaways would you like to see in US Survivor? How would they fare on a War of the World season? Let us know in the comment section down below. A huge thank you to Analytical Strategy for collaborating on this video, and if you haven't already, go check out his channel. Thanks a bunch Snuffed for having me on your channel. This was a really fun topic and I'm really enjoying the new Survivor South Africa season. And I'm super keen for new Survivor Australia and US seasons coming out shortly. I also think it's really fantastic how much the Survivor YouTube community is willing to jump in and help each other out and assist in each other's growth. There are so many other fantastic topics yet to be explored on this platform. So I highly recommend subscribing to Snuffed, Reality Pop, myself, whoever it may be. The more one channel grows, we all grow together. So again, thanks a heap and stay tuned for more content on analytical strategy coming in the future. A special thanks also to Chris from Reality Pop. If you'd like to see more international Survivor content, Chris joins me each and every week to break down everything from both Australian Survivor and Survivor South Africa with some special guest hosts. And be sure to join us for the season premiere of Australian Survivor, Brains vs Brawn, this week over on Reality Pop. Of course, if you enjoyed this video, please feel free to give this video a like and consider subscribing to the channel for all the fixins. Also, check out Analytical Strategy and Reality Pop, links in the description down below. Survivor sees no borders. There's a vast world of game players out there willing to give it their all for this show we love so dearly. Grab your torches, head back to camp. Good night.